everyone and welcome. Welcome to this session on mass digitization. Uh, it's a huge topic. We could all spend uh, at least an entire day on this topic. So please be prepared during this session right now to think about capturing your insights and your ideas as we go by, uh, so we don't want to lose them, uh, as well as your questions, both for the speakers and for the all the panelists who will join us uh, at the end of the presentations. We have an international lineup for you today, so we're, we're very excited to be welcoming people here from around the planet. Uh, and without further delay, uh, we'd like to get started. And we ask that you uh, put your questions in the chat so we don't lose them. Thanks very much. And I am welcoming you along with uh, the other moderators and organizers of this symposium, Hanu Serenma and Erica Kreml. And with that, our first speaker uh, is Jeroen Bluthoft, uh, who will be talking to us uh, about a matter of scale. Jeroen, are you ready? I am ready. Yay. I will share my screen and let me see, it is right here. Okay, everyone, welcome. Oh, I need to do this, of course. There we go. So, close this one. Okay, well, um, yeah, matter of scale. I'm gonna show you a completely new device, um, machine to digitize pinned insect collections. Uh, but first, most of you might not know who you are, so I have a little movie about PictureEye and what the PictureEye company is about. So let's see if this works as it should. Yeroen, this is lovely. Is there sound too, or only the video? So, <clears throat> now you all have a glimpse of uh, the picture I company. These are some of the clients we work for. Uh, they're basically worldwide and we work on location with projects and in our main studios in the Netherlands. You can see a large chunk of what we do, the services we offer is for the biodiversity community. Um, and that has been since about 2013. Um, but I'm not here to talk about us and talk about this special project that we're doing for the Museum for Natuurkunde in Berlin. I'm currently in Berlin. Um, yesterday was the press conference and a um, invitees reception for the opening of a exhibition that's all about digitization of their collection. Now, the Museum for Natuurkunde is on a 10 year project to catalog or um, make available all their 30 million objects. One of their biggest collections is the insect collection with about 15 million estimated, of course, specimens. Now, we've been talking to them for years to come up with a solution to digitize them in, well, in the aspects that they need. So this led to a, a concept, designs, etc., And through a public tender, 
they um, ask for the service to be provided. We send in a very thorough proposal with an idea of a machine that actually didn't exist at that time. And we, um, well, we got the job and we started to work on it. I, I'm not going to read out the slide, obviously, but it's about half a million specimens. And part of the job is not just um, digitizing the specimens, but also rehousing them from old drawers into new drawers and putting them in unit trays in that process. So just a little bit about things that you might, that you all probably know, right? Um, labels, just as important um, for the digital unlocking of everything. Labels are diverse, all kinds. Uh, you probably made more <laughs> yourself than I've seen. Um, insects are pink, big variety. Um, um, the, 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 the state of the insects is very different from one to the next, etc. So we looked at the system requirements to tackle such an operation and um, to basically to dictate the design we needed to use. So we needed the system to be flexible, different insect sizes, one of multiple views of the, of the specimens. Um, and still it had to be a mass digitization, a high throughput solution with consistent results, of course, reliability needs to be solid and run, it needs to be quick. But paramount, of course, the safety of the specimens. You know, we don't want to tackle, uh, do bad things to them in any way. And the solution that we were envisioning needed to cover most of the collections. Obviously, there's always exceptions due to size, fragility, etc. We came to a few design principles which um, in the conceptual phase, etc., and we realized the whole camera system was very quick, but also very expensive. And we wanted to use that continuously. So we came to the design where we needed to have multiple operators, multiple staff to feed that system. So that was one of our vantage points. We wanted to minimize all the manual actions and handling of the specimens. And we wanted to do the specimen handling completely manual. We have tried some with robotics, but it never came to a point where we thought it was realistic at this point in time. And then all the staff on the belt needed to be able to control the process. They need to set their own pace. They didn't need to be able to follow some sort of speed or something like that. Um, so that's also something we wanted to accommodate. And then again, the integrity of the specimen labels is, is um, well, it's the most important thing. We didn't want to separate the labels from the insects. Um, we needed to have training for the people from the collection and use their way of working um, to be able to be part of this process. Now, I told you rehousing was part of the project. So for us, it started with imaging the whole drawer. What you see here is the software we use, but the image is interesting. If you look closely, you see three mirrors or actually four around the, the drawer. So we were able to capture with one single capture also the information on the sides of the drawer, which is very important in the next step that I will talk to you about. Also, we, of course, by doing this, we record the state of the collection as it, well, as it was. Um, <clears throat> sorry. We needed to uh, use software to track where we are, which, which drawers have been done. We added uh, identifiers to the drawers. It's the whole complete process to make sure, you know, where things came from and where things are going to. Now, in the end, the final images of those drawer captures look a bit like this. You can see the three sides of the drawer with possibly information there. You can see the drawer, but if you look closely, you can also see this piece of software um, has frames around groups of insects within the drawer. This was specially uh, developed to let the curators of the Museum Pune uh, make the grouping of the insects. We were not just putting them in new drawers, but also in unit trays. And again, the tracking would tell us which have been processed, which has been annotated, and so forth. And here you see a little see a few images of what this final unit tray looks like. 
we have added a label printing system and the curators would add any information that was at their hands on taxonomic information and so forth, which would end up on the labels, but also obviously ready to go into a database. Let's see. Yes, then we come to the imaging process, the imaging system itself. You can see a little glimpse in the picture. You can see my colleague David, one of our IT engineers. Uh, I think this is at the testing stage at Naturalis. Um, I saw Luke Willems is here from Naturalis. We are very uh, grateful for Naturalis to lending them actually a, uh, an exhibition hall to uh, trial run this system and do a lot more development, uh, uh, development uh, finishing and other fine tuning. Now, the system you will see more later, but the system consists of a transport conveyor-like belt to a camera system in the core and multiple workstations around the system. What you see in the little, um, well, in the little picture there is how the workstations are set up. This place for the insect drawers, and uh, we use all kinds of smart tooling to handle the insects, remove the labels from the pins, and uh, place the well, insects on um, yeah, what do I call it, transportation trays. I'll tell a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, let me think. Yeah, and then we have that technical center where all the images are captured. Now, insects uh, vary from size to size, but also there might be placed differently on the pin and the staff that puts the pin on this little mast that you see there uh, will do it in an angle, for instance. But if we want to tell the camera where to focus exactly to get a sharp picture, we need to know exactly the size and the position of the insect. So our first camera system um, takes two silhouette pictures in a 3D motion and feeds that information to the two cameras numbered, uh, uh, well, actually the one is not numbered, but <laughs> we have a camera from above and a camera in front, so two cameras. And by these coordinates, we know where the first image needs to be taken. So the robotic arm and a, um, what do you call that, mechanical system moves the camera to its first position. Then we take three shots of every few. We use lateral, dorsal, and frontal views, um, and then we use the focus stacking technology to take the sharpest bit of every of these 30 images and put them together into one image that has a sharp picture of every insect from head to tail. Um, next step is two cameras that capture the labels, and we actually flip the labels over with device that's number six here, You'll see it later in a little uh, movie. So we can also capture the labels on the back. This is a overview picture. Uh, I think this is actually a movie. Okay, I'll, I'll stop talking now and let you watch how this works.
Okay, well, <laughs> it must have been very interesting to watch. Um, yes, there's, so there's a lot of technology involved in those um, um, in those workstations, in the capturing, the transportation, every tray with an insect and its labels return to the exact same workstation as they were. They get um, they go back into the unit tray in the drawer where they came from. We do that by image recognition, some small, some small AI technology where we know from which position from a drawer the insect was taken. And later when it's placed back, maybe you noticed it, we project a laser dot in that exact position to be able for the member of staff to put it back in the exact same spot. Well, these are some images. They don't do really justice, of course, in the presentation, but very soon you will see tons of images coming up through the um, MHM digital future portal. Um, in short, that was what I had to show you today. I hope it is all um, well. You could hear me well. <laughs> oh, yes, I can hear you. Lovely. Thank you. So there's a conversation in the chat and uh, we have time, I believe, for questions. And I am, would like to ask first the moderators, Hanu and Erika, if there's anything you'd like to ask or start with before we take the questions that came up in the chat. No, I think the, the discussion going on in the chat would be great to post to Jeroen. Yeah, so we have to give Jeroen a chance to have a look at the chat. I will. I see 28 messages, so I'll exactly. do my best to go through them. All. So you have to slide down let's see, let's here see. to get started. Um, uh, yeah. Go to the Q&A first. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, you want me to do that first? Okay, sure. I see, I see. Ah, oh, there are three in the Q&A and there are more in the chat. Um, so the Q&A, I'm, I'm reading. Yes, I see the first one saying the flash doesn't affect the sample color or something. Um, I'm not completely sure I understand the question, but in principle, the color reproduction is um, is set up in such a way that it's true to the to the specimen. It's LED uh, light. It's it's quite bright as you can see, but it's also very very short. So um, yeah. Erica, the, did you the, want to add something to that? I wasn't sure how you. The Q&A nope, said you, nope, you wanted nope. to say so, something. So um, okay. the next question in the Q&A is what file type do you use? Are they TIFFs, JPEGs? Well, in principle, they could be anything you like. Uh, because we do focus stacking, it's usually a master file, let's say a TIFF or a, um, uh, a completely reversible JPEG 2000. But in principle, that's it's just, um, it could be anything. It could be multiple. Usually it's multiple, obviously one publication file, one master file for a long-term storage. The next question is, do you ever have issues with pieces or labels falling or blowing off with the rapid movement? Uh, actually, no, not at all. Um, we have had, when we were trialing at Naturalis, we had the same labels going round and round for, um, for hours sometimes. They, I, I have to admit, they do move to the side of the tray a little bit, but uh, we do, uh, I'm gonna be very honest with you, we do have a little issue when the labels are, for instance, a different kind of paper like cardboard, uh, something like that, or we have a very hefty fold in it. But my team is now actually covering that situation by using little covers that are uh, flawlessly um, uh, flipped over. So actually that's, that's turned out to be quite the, dare I say, the easiest part of <laughs> all the developments. What's the cost per specimen? Yellow? Yes, of course, I could have known that question, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have to find out, obviously we did estimates for this project, but we have to find out where the speed really is and what the cost of everything uh, will be translated to one specimen, obviously. Um, there is a point where this doesn't obviously work for small collections. We don't, we only have one. 
it's in perfect working condition. It's been finalized now right here in at the museum in, in, in an exhibition space, which is great to see, by the way. <laughs> Come see it. But um, yeah, we're now doing, well, they set out to do 250,000 specimens at the museum. But when we showed them that the price would actually drop by about a third by going with a higher count, which is now half a million, that was their, uh, uh, well, they made a choice to go for a higher volume. Um, it would be somewhere between two, uh, between two and three euros a specimen right now. And then when you go in higher volumes, let's say up to a million, then the price doesn't go down anymore. We've done our calculations on that, but what it will finally be is still out for uh, uh, experience. Got it. Thank you. Um, David wants to know if this includes OCR for the labels. It doesn't include it. We could obviously do it. It's just a software um, post-processing step, but there's a lot of handwritten uh, material, obviously. So we're going to start a pilot to try and use uh, uh, handwritten text recognition or a combination with OCR. So we're very much looking forward to that. Ideally, we want to have a completely finished uh, um, data set at the end of this process. So this is very important to us to, to put all our efforts in. OCR would, would be possible, but it wouldn't cover everything. So we need to find something smarter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a few more, and there's a couple in the chat. We'll try to get to them all here. How much time does it take for all of the specimens of a box of a particular drawer to be photographed? Yeah, I realize I never mentioned the speed, but we estimated that it can do 5,000 per day, and it's about 650-ish per workstation, depending on how many specimens are in a box, which could be, I don't know, could it be 400 in it? So that you would do one, two, maybe three boxes per workstation per day. Drawers, it, it, it depends, you know, if it's, an empty, <laughs> if it's empty drawers, you might do a lot more. Mm, thank you. Um, how do you deal with very glossy or smooth specimens? Do you use any filters for lighting? Yes, we, we can work with uh, things like polarized filtering um, and we will adapt for the specimen. So this is the Hemenoptera collection, collection and it's set up for that. If we would do a completely different, let's say beetles or something, we would have to, well, I wouldn't say start from scratch, but we would approach it completely from the ground up to see what the right setting of capture and lighting are. Because mm -hmm. we want to have a, a true to life uh, reproduction. Thank you. Um, there's a couple in the chat I wanna catch up on. Um, could you comment briefly on the cotton gloves? There were people who were expressing concern over. Yes, no, it's, uh, it's, I have to actually, <laughs> it was, uh, so this movie was not perfect. Obviously, we don't really use gloves in the process. It's, uh, it was a little bit of over uh, enthusiasm by the people uh, that were in the, in the picture. So, <laughs> Hmm. But the, the glove thing is not uh, actually being used unless there would be a requirement, but it would not be the cotton gloves in that case, but something uh, much more suitable. I okay. see the size shape limitations. We can go up to eight centimeters right now, but it's because the, the, the entrance there, the, the, let's say the, the gap that the thing moves through is, is that size. So in theory, if we adjust uh, all the equipment, you could do bigger as well, but we think up to eight centimeters, we cover most of all the specimens and we can go very small. You can see the, even the, the metal details on the, on the, on the pins. Um, there was some concern about the labels being dissociated. Can you talk just a tiny bit about the quality control? How, what are the processes set up to try to ensure that the labels that were on it get back on it? Like how, how can that be checked or validated? Yes. So there's a few things we, we try to build in all these kinds of checks, if you will. Um, for one thing, uh, if we capture the front side of the labels, we know how many labels there should be and, and in which position they are. So the, the, the backside image, if you will, 
is checked versus that. And we did that in large numbers up to a point that there's really uh, no concern at all. Um, as they get back to the uh, same workstation, we can build in a safety there as well because we capture uh, the drawer just to know where the specimen came from. But we could also capture the area where the labels are placed so we can do a check on that point. Sorry, I'm muted. The process includes cases in which there is more than one label per sample. I think we saw that, right? There were more than yeah, one yeah. There was there can be one. Uh, we we done. I think yeah. Between one and five is most average. I think uh, in theory you got quite a big area to place the labels. It could it could accommodate even more. But, uh, uh, yeah, from safe to safe. Hmm. Um, I think. I'm looking here, looking in the chat as well um, to see if there's more questions. If I missed one, Hanu or Erica, please let me know. So Deb, there's a, a question that follows along to this last one. Well, so Tommy wanted to know specifically, are unique identifiers being captured at the label um, photography stage? Yes. So um, in this case, um, in this project, we at the I might not have mentioned that. When we rehouse the insects from the old drawer to the new, we add a new identifier label with a small QR code and a readable uh, number on both sides, so bottom and top of the label, so you can turn the specimen around to read it, if you will. So when it goes on the imaging system, the identifier label is then present. But not all collections would want to rehouse first as a first step, so we Originally, the concept is to add a unique identifier label at the place where the insects are placed on the trays. Hmm. Cool. Um, there are two more questions, and I think people need to jump in if I've missed one, please. Uh, what's the job of the robotic arm on the left side of the final image? Yes. Um, it's a good question. It has one function, and it's to move the camera into position. Um, the camera is on a spindle to be able to, in a fluid motion, uh, um, move towards the specimen and make its 30 captures. It all happens within a second, and actually the focus second processing also happens within a second uh, per view. Um, so the robotic arm puts the camera in uh, yeah, let's say at the right position for it to have its starting point, but also it could accommodate, for instance, we now do three, three views, your top, bottom, and front, but in theory, or not in theory, in practice, you could have it actually look under the wings of a butterfly, for instance, and then in that case, the robotic arm would have to move the camera in an angle to get that fourth view, if you will. So that's its, uh, its, it, that's its function. Thanks, Jeroen. We have two more questions. I would ask you to please answer them um, as we move on to the next speaker. So while you could stop sharing your screen and yeah, I will. let I will. the next person get them set up to share the recording, um, then, then you can jump in and answer our genital preparations glued to plates also photographed. That's one question. And the other one from uh, Matt Yoder is, um, what about if there are labels? I think that's what mm -hmm. you mean, Matt, uh, where there's text on both sides. So if you could answer those, that would be great. Yeah, They're inside yeah. the Q&A. Next up, um, next we, up we take, sorry, oh, I was sorry. gonna say, I was gonna get, uh, if you could answer those inside the Q&A, you can type ah, your answer. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. And we'll then do. we can get on to the next uh, talk. So with that, Hanu, I believe this is going to be, and uh, Chris, are you gonna share the recording? Yep, yes. I've got that ready. All right. Hello, ready. hello from Finland. Uh, uh, we have pre-recorded our talk, so let's roll. Here we go. Hello, my name is Hannu Hannu Saranma. I'm one of the authors of this talk. Our first author, Jere 
Gohan Bear is unfortunately ill today, so he, uh, I'm, I'm going to give this talk on his behalf. I'm com I, I come from the BioShare dig digitization company, uh, which um, has is a university spin out. Uh, we have been working together with the Finnish Museum of Natural History since uh, ten uh, more than ten years. Yes, we have five years of experience in using insect imaging uh, mass digitization system driven by conveyor system. Um, and uh, we want to share uh, our experiences uh, in doing that. The challenge is 10 million insect specimens in this national collection. Uh, it's organized systematically and it integrates uh, hundreds uh, of original collections uh, from the past 200 uh, years. It's physically heterogeneous because uh, labeling practices have changed uh, quite a bit uh, through all these uh, decades. Uh, so when we're digitizing specimens, we need to be prepared to see anything uh, uh, there. Uh, sometimes we have uh, labels with complete data, uh, and sometimes we have just a catalog number etc. This is housed, this collection is housed in a modern cooled hall built underground in 2008 and and all these uh, specimens uh, have been rehoused in in a modern plastic transparent unit trays which is an important uh, thing uh, which will I'll, I'll tell you later why. There has been uh, <clears throat> plenty of planning here. We have a national digitization strategy for the natural history collections, uh, which was determined uh, more than 10 years ago. We have used uh, plenty of European Union funding to, to build the infrastructure. Um, there, there was a national digitization center, Digitarium, which operated for eight years, uh, but it is now spun out into a, uh, a commercial company. Furthermore, there was this European Union project, ISDIC, uh, which explored new technologies uh, just a few years ago. Uh, and we're building on ISDIC uh, uh, recommendations. Technological opportunities are, are many. Uh, basically, we have adopted uh, the uh, conveyor-driven technology from herbarium uh, collections and and uh, change those a little bit for insect collections. We have developed uh, related workflows and software and hardware, which are being packaged uh, in, in integrated products. Uh, the technologies which we are exploring now is uh, 3D modeling, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. So here is the uh, insect conveyor system which was built uh, already uh, eight years ago and it's still available on the market um, if somebody wants to have this kind of system it fits in a normal office it's fully automatic single user system with multiple cameras data transfer rate is way higher than uh, people are able to handle specimens and their labels the output in, in this uh, past five and a half years, some 40, 420,000 pinned insect specimens have been digitized. So the annual amount is 76,000 and sustained performance is uh, 345 specimens a working day, 43 per hour, and which uh, means uh, 83 seconds per specimen. It's been Lepidoptera, but pilots also for Coleoptera and Synthita have been done. Each specimen was photographed uh, using dorsal or lateral view, depending on the specimen, uh, if it's spread or not. Labels were detached, if possible, and the separate picture was taken of the labels, automatically, of course. Concurrently, basic data entry was done uh, while the conveyor was working. The the operator typed these uh, few uh, main um, data fields uh, into Microsoft Excel. This worked uh, 
for about 90% of the specimens because there was 83 seconds to do that. And all this data is publicly available now at the FinBIF portal. So all handling and data entry is done by one operator. The, system, the work, for workflow is really critical to get right. It's being used, uh, the system is being, being used uh, eight hours a day, which is divided in four two hour work shifts. Longer work shifts were, were tried, but, uh, but uh, the fatigue after, during the third hour already became significant and that was abandoned. So uh, there are four uh, shifts uh, and uh, a, a museum curator is, uh, there is a team of four to six museum curators who who come step in uh, in their turn. It's all scheduled very accurately. Process starts with the pinned sample being mounted on a 3D printed printed imaging tray, where there are se separate spaces for the specimen and the labels. In addition, a unique identifier is added, which will also be photographed among the other, all, all the labels. And then when, it's, when the specimen and the labels have been placed on this imaging tray, it's put um, to the conveyor system and everything is automatic from that on. Uh, while imaging is done, the operator does uh, transcription data entry from computer screen uh, but uh, if uh, when the sample come from comes fr back from the conveyor uh, if it's not transcribed at that point um, the operator has to uh, go back to Im imaging and uh, and uh, complete the uh, transcription later there is post processing uh, uh, later on uh, automatic georeferencing, etc. Et it took a long time to get this workflow right, but it is now, now pretty well driven in. The imaging trays are, uh, are made by 3D printing. There is a very carefully thought uh, out layout uh, so that uh, we can get optimal uh, pictures. Uh, we use mirrors to see underside of labels like here uh, top image side image uh, showing also the labels in this case it's easy because it is uh, uh, there are very few labels here but you can see here uh, at the bottom uh, the mirror of mirror image of that label from underside and here is the unique identifier There is a whole slew of uh, software that was developed for this purpose. Uh, there is a conveyor control, camera control diff on different computers. Uh, there is a specimen setting assistant to the uh, uh, imaging tray, which must have take place millimeter accuracy so that the images are sharp. Uh, the server processing, post-processing uh, is uh, also important uh, to create digital objects out of the uh, out of the images and the data. And there are export functions to the FinBIF portal, which is shown here on the on the screen, where you see the insect image and the label image. You just click them, and you can see the details. There is also a collection management system where internal to the museum. Here is the com component architecture, the control computer, the control center, which is a real-time uh, system which controls the conveyors, and there is the imaging subset. And here is the server computer uh, doing post-processing. So the approach works and the output is satisfactory for a single user system. Uh, we can still think that if you have 10 million specimens and you've done only half million in five years, uh, you can see that it's going to take a while. So uh, it, this works for 
I would say medium-sized collections, one million specimens, this works uh, certainly very well, but for 10 million you need to explore ways to scale this uh, up uh, by a factor of 10. Adding 10 similar systems next to each other would scale, but only linearly. We need to find, find a better way. There are two approaches. Get rid of handing, handling the labels. This would be ideal, but it's difficult. Then, alternatively, you could use a large multi-user system. And I'm now going to show a couple of videos uh, of both approaches. Um, first, the large multi-user system and then 3D, 3D imaging. So, we, out of the personal system, we moved to um, a large system, which was originally built for uh, herbarium sheets, but it can be used also for smaller objects. And what is important here is that you can put uh, up to eight people on this around this uh, large conveyor, so it's scalable. Here we only have one operator in this video, but uh, you can imagine put, having several operators uh, on both sides of the large conveyor. Here's another view from the other end of the conveyor line. There are two cameras. And here is the final output. The other approach which I'm going to show here from another video is uh, 3D uh, modeling. Here is a, a drawer with uh, those uh, unit trays and uh, about on, the, on those uh, motorized uh, camera head there are three webcams and they are they move on rails and and uh, they spin around each and every insect specimen uh, for a while, taking maybe about 100 images of each. And then um, out of those 100 images, you, we can make a 3D model of the insect or we can just pick up the labels from the, from the system, uh, from, from the pin. Another view of the same thing. Every specimen is photographed from four different angles by three different cameras. And we hope to get all the label information that way. Okay. Uh, Time to stop. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I hope this was inspiring. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Hani. It was great to see another example of uh, actually a couple of different ways that you showed that this can be done. Um, please start putting your questions in the Q&A. I see um, an implied question here we can start with that Ainsley shares about what about when you try to do this with the shingled specimens um, and has anybody tackled that what, what what's possible what has to be done yes uh, this is Hanu speaking uh, that is a, actually an innovation those plastic trays have multiple uh, benefits. One is that we can sometimes, we can get some pictures through them. The other total different advantage is that um, 
that uh, those plastic trays are slippery and they dermestid beetles cannot climb them. Well, they may get in, but they don't get out, which is a hugely important factor. So I would suggest everybody to consider uh, this approach uh, for their insect collections. Cardboard is not pest free, but this this can be if they are uh, if the plastic made, trays are well made. Thanks, Hanu. Were you looking at the question in the Q and A when you answered that about the plastic unit trays? Yes, I did. Okay, I see that. Uh, cool. Other questions for Hanu? We still have a minute or two. One, one question I think we have time for. Ah, somebody got in under the wire there. Do you have any issues with static electricity with those plastic trays? Uh, no, I have not heard of that. Maybe the museum curators uh, have some more experience, but it has never come to my, to my uh, 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 knowledge. Uh, there are no, you know, you see, there are no covers on these plastic trays. They are held inside normal drawers. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's one faction factor to consider. Okay. I certainly have more questions, so they'll wait until the end. Um, thank you very much, Hanu. And now I think it, I also see a comment for you from Floyd Shockley in the chat about wanting some more information. So there's that. And now on to our next speaker. Um, and that would be uh, Mark Harold and Crystal Meyer, um, a lightning bug. Hello, and thanks to the organizers and presenters for such a great and informative ECN meeting so far. I'm Crystal Meyer, the Curatorial Associate for Entomology at Harvard University, and Mark Harold, my co-presenter, is a senior computer scientist at Argonne National Labs. And we're here to introduce a recently NSF-funded initiative to improve the way that we acquire insect label and morphological data. This effort is called Lightning Bug and is an integrated pipeline to overcome the biodiversity digitization gap. First, though Mark and I are presenters on this project, this is actually a collaborative effort of many different institutions and PIs each with combined expertise in imaging, photogrammetry, computer vision, workflow development, transcription, community building, and data dissemination, all working together to improve the way that we capture and mobilize museum insect specimen data. I'd be preaching to the choir to tell you that all insect collections are a huge untapped resource for biodiversity data. As all of you are well aware, Insect collections around the globe house hundreds of millions of specimens, spanning 300 years of collecting. Each specimen is a small data point that can tell us more about the morphology, evolutionary biology, and phenology of insect species. The data, however, is locked up on little pieces of paper attached to the specimens and on the physical specimens themselves that are stored in our drawers. Recent efforts to migrate this data to a digital form have been slow and painstaking. You're all familiar with a workflow like this one, though maybe there's a little variation in your particular institutions. Specimens are barcoded, the labels are either read directly or transcribed from photos. The data are then parsed into machine-readable fields, and then the specimen is georeferenced to capture the locality data, and possibly even imaged to capture the morphological data. This process is labor intensive, and therefore, we've needed to prioritize the, spec the specimens that are digitized, often only choosing only the highest value specimens, such as specimens whose data are immediately required by the research community, or for historically important specimens, such as types. A recent search of digitized occurrence records for preserved or museum vouchered specimens on gvip.org reveals over 30 million records that are digitized and available through data aggregators. This seems like a lot, doesn't it? And maybe a vast improvement over where we were 10 years ago. Unfortunately, it's still just a drop in the bucket. It is slow going, despite a great deal of effort and funding through programs such as the NSF ADBC program 
in the US and with logistical and training support from organizations such as iDigBio, we've barely made a dent in the number of specimens digitized as a portion of the total holdings of insect collections. These resources have definitely solidified sort of a cultural shift towards digitization as an integrated part of collection management. And we now focus a great deal of collection management effort towards digitization and improving the efficiency of these digitization workflows. However, due to the sheer number of specimens in our collections, as well as the significant lag time between when we first started collecting insects and when we started digitizing in a significant way, there exists what we're calling a digitization gap. A gap which, despite our best efforts, shows no sign of narrowing with our current and very efficient workflows. There really needs to be a technological shift in order to close this gap. Enter Lightning Bug, which aims to close the gap through an integrated workflow of multi-view imaging, label reconstruction, photogrammetric reconstruction, OCR and HCR, and community label validation. Through multi-view imaging using the COPUS system developed by Nelson Rios and his colleagues at Yale, images of up to 300 views of an individual specimen will be used to generate a complete morphological reconstruction of the specimen. Once imaged, label data can then be extracted from a subset of these image, images that allow for pin labels to be transcribed without ever having to remove the labels from the pins. Mark Harold and Nicola Ferrier are facilitating the development of this software. These label images will then be passed through a Notes from Nature platform for community validation. This effort will be led by Rob Goralnik and Michael Denslow. All of this data will then be aggregated and served out to places like GBIF and Morphosource. In the development of the lightning bug system, we plan to pilot an innovative new workflow, which will capture label data at a target image suite throughput rate of about 10 minutes per virtual specimen. That is full 3D reconstruction of that specimen and about 10 seconds per virtual label, thus allowing us hopefully to close this digitization gap. If imaging systems using technology similar to Lightning Bug are deployed at collections across the US, it's estimated that label data from about 30 million specimens can be captured each year. To give you some context, that's about a whole GBIFs worth of digitized insect specimen data per year. And you're probably already dreaming about what you can do with all of that data, but just to give you some ideas, uh, it can be used for specimen identification, taxonomy, education, condition assessment, morphometrics, graphic arts, media, all sorts of great things. And so now I'd like to hand it over to Mark, who will provide us a, with a little bit more of the technical details and the nuts and bolts of this project. Thank you, Crystal. At the heart of our digitization approach is multi-view imaging, which provides us with the data needed to digitally reconstruct objects on the pin. Also note that to the extent that multiple cameras can be simultaneously employed, we can speed up the process of capturing the data. For a detailed model of a specimen, it is necessary to capture hundreds of images from positions around the object. As indicated on the right-hand diagram, points on the object can be matched in images from several views to triangulate their position in 3D space. Sophisticated software now exists to carry out this process on such large image sets. The field of photogrammetry under these conditions is mature enough that open source packages are widely available. Lightning bug will leverage the COPUS system for its image capture needs. COPUS is a flexible robotic camera system developed initially to automate 3D digitization of typically larger specimens from fish, 
to cultural heritage artifacts. It can be configured to meet the constraints and needs both in the research and financial domains of a given project. Multiple cameras can be orchestrated to provide single view reference imagery, focal stacks, mosaics of larger specimens, and high density multi-view image sets. Configured with six cameras, it will be able to automatically and rapidly collect the hundreds of images needed for our detailed model reconstructions. Here are a few examples of high resolution models created by COPUS. I hope that the potential of such 3D imagery is evident. And they also illustrate most clearly in the left hand, hand image how multi-view images can be used to capture all of the information on labels stacked under the specimen on the pin, despite occlusion from any particular view. But the time required to capture these hundreds of images, circa 10 minutes for COPUS, would not allow us to digitize the vast repository of existing incoming specimens in a timely fashion. For the goal of achieving sufficient speed up to meet the 30 million specimen per year required, we will supplement the detailed modeling effort just described. In this label focused imaging referred to by Crystal, we will capture six to 12 images, which is one to two snaps of the six camera configuration of COPUS. This can be done in around 10 seconds. Unfortunately, and perhaps surprisingly, the available photogrammetry software mentioned above succeeds because of the very high number of images provided to it. Therefore, development of robust software to extract virtual labels from a small number of images will be one of the efforts we pursue in Lightning Bug. We've demonstrated that by combining label images from these multi-view sets requiring finding the label, geometrically undistorting each oblique view, and compositing aligned fragments can result in a high quality virtual label. These virtual labels can then be fed to OCR software to obtain low error reconstructions of the text found on the label as seen on the left panel. We have also found that existing well-trained neural networks can be used to detect text segments directly from the images before rectification and segmentation, information that can be used to supplement the approach already outlined. We expect a large amount of data from this image acquisition pipeline. To help with validation of the virtual image quality and with information extraction from the raw OCR text, we will engage the people-powered methods supported by the Zooniverse platform. Notes from Nature, a very successful citizen science tool hosted in the Zooniverse universe, will be used in this capacity. Lightning bug image data, primarily in the form of virtual labels, will be subjected to a workflow along the lines of this six step process. In addition to a quality score to be used by the lightning bug development team to assess and steer optimization of our algorithms, Notes from Nature will provide a persistent store for reanalysis, information extraction, and results retrieval. And finally, the members of the Lightning Bug team gratefully acknowledge support from their home institutions and the partnering projects that will play a role in the development of this unique pipeline. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Crystal and Mark. Uh, cool to have three very different examples in a row to think about. Um, are there any questions in the Q&A ready to go? I don't see uh, any, yeah, oh, maybe one just came in. It looks yeah. like um, Ainsley wants to know, does this method only work with printed labels so far? If you're talking about the uh, reconstruction of the label content that I mentioned, um, that's the only thing where we've had some success so far. 
but um, the neural networks that I mentioned that are, are widely available out there in the wild um, are actually capable of, of looking at and deciphering um, fairly well uh, handwriting. Uh, it remains to be seen for our purposes, uh, you know, whether whether we can kind of incorporate that in. But the part of the uh, the notes from nature effort um, and a sister project called um, Leap, I dig leap, leap dog dig. Um, Rob uh, Gorelnik um, is going to be aimed at that project, at that aspect of separating out the um, uh, text on the labels into handwritten and block written and uh, strictly typewritten uh, text and then um, going ahead and, and uh, sending that through corresponding uh, neural network based OCR. So in other words, neural networks is fancy software that's getting better at interpreting handwriting. Yes, and, and huge companies, Google uh, uh, in particular, have devoted a lot of resources um, in terms of people compute and uh, have collected large, large data sets, which is crucial in training these uh, kinds of networks to do a good job. Um, and so they've been able to throw a lot more energy into um, solving that problem. So it's yeah. it's actually coming along quite nicely. That came up at Tadwig. We can talk more about it later. That last week's meeting, a bit more about people moving in that direction. Um, two quick questions, because our session's almost ready for a break before we come back from that for our last talk and some and panel discussion. Um, how well does this work? Uh, what do you do in the case of multiply, multiply close, sorry, multiple closely spaced labels? Um, so that's very, you know, collection dependent, exactly what the distribution of label spacing is on various insects in a given collection. We've done uh, simulations um, and with 12 cameras, um, now we haven't done exhaustive simulations, so I don't know whether we could get away with say eight cameras or something like that, but with 12 shots and um, uh, placed appropriately um, at a, a couple of angles around here, we've seen that um, we get fairly um, high probability of being able to say every point on every label in the imagery collected is closely spaced as about two and a half millimeters. Um, beyond that, uh, you might have to do some automatic movement in response to uh, 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 detecting where the labels are. And we haven't yet explored that part of the the space, but for a large number of a uh, 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 fraction of the of the space involved of configurations that are likely to show up, uh, we think it will probably do a pretty well, pretty pretty good job. Cool. And there's one more question in the Q and A proper. Not in. I haven't covered it in the notes uh, in the in the chat. Um, have you been able to assign field names to the text transcribed? I'm um, not sure, Joy Lim, that, uh, that may mean like... We have not done that board. part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, and I can, I can address that. Um, so that is where, so our collaborators at Notes from Nature um, have sort of a complementary project and it is called DigiLeap. And they're working on botanical specimens, but they're tackling that exact problem that you mentioned. So parsing the data that then um, that would that's been extracted by our system. So we're going to be working in close collaboration collaboration with them to get that data parsed. Um, and I saw real quick. I saw a um, a Q and A in the chat okay. about use of um, other transcription platforms uh, such as Digivol or. Um, Atlas of Living Australia. And just to address that question, um, we plan to use Notes from Nature as more of a validation sort of system rather than getting direct transcriptions from them. Um, the plan is just to have them validate our OCR and to classify the labels. And then if we need human transcription, that would be a further step. And I'm sure you can use Atlas of Living Australia or 
um, Digivol as well. We're just developing the infrastructure for notes from nature. So, yep. Well, thank you very much. And thank you everyone so far for your lovely questions and insights and the wonderful presentations. And now it is time, if I've figured it correctly, for our um, 10 minute break. And we would see you back here at uh, 20 minutes after the hour, I believe. Did I get that right? At the 20 after the hour mark. So I think we can move on to the next talk if you're ready to queue that up for us, Chris. And this is from Matt Yoder and Deb Paul. Hello, everyone. On behalf of myself and all of my co-authors, it's good to be here, part of ECN 2021, even if it is just virtual. As a word of introduction, this is work coming from the Species File Group and its collaborators all around the world. Today, I'd like to particularly point out the efforts of Jose and Hernan uh, down in La Plata, Argentina. Jose is our user interface specialist and Hernan does a lot of our backend work. Both of them are responsible for the Darwin Core Archive Importer, a, a very cool feature, new feature in TaxonWorks. And I really wanna thank them for all the work that they've done today. Just as a word of disclaimer, a lot of the interaction that you see that are live on TaxonWorks also have parts edited out of, out of them. So do be aware that some of what you see has been condensed for time. So just a quick overview to get started. The overall goal is to raise a couple of ideas, talk about a couple of ideas, and just put them in the context of how we're going about digitizing our natural history collections. So I'll start off by talking about this concept of going from rows to things and try to explain what that might mean for digitization. And then I'll uh, point out a couple of emerging digitization technologies and concepts that may impact mass or singular digitization efforts. Some of these are coming from ideas that were presented at TADRIG last year, and some of these are ongoing efforts or, or, or new efforts that uh, have emerged recently. So I'd like to ask a couple of questions or have people think about a couple of things throughout the presentation. And maybe these will lead into some questions during the panel after the talk. So first, how might a thing-based digitization model pre-adapt us to adopting new technologies? In digitization, there's always new technologies coming out. Um, what does it mean to think about it from a thing-based perspective? And second, what are new technologies requiring of the curators of natural history collections? Is this additional work reasonable relative to its payoff reward? So the idea is that we can look critical on any sort of emerging ideas or approaches and kind of take a step back and, and look at whether or not the payoff for doing these digital steps or taking these digital steps or generating these digital data or creating these digital linkages is uh, really worth the additional effort relative to the tasks that we have uh, with respect to the physical curation of our collections. All right, let's start by trying to explain the rows to things concept. I'll do this by looking at a brand new feature in TaxonWorks, a Darwin Core Archive importer. In brief, I'm going to drop a Darwin Core Archive zip file onto the importer, give it a little description, pick some settings, and let it, do it, let it do its thing for a little while. We'll come back after a bit and see what's happened. Here I give it a description. I drop my file on. And we're back. Behind the scenes, I did a little bit of configuration. I chose some settings here to map the catalog numbers present in this UCR data set that I downloaded from scan bugs and subsampled just 10 rows from. I, I did some mapping of those settings here. And I also used the ability to edit in place here the records. I changed all of the values of pinned that were in the original data set to a value pinned pin. So it would be recognized as one of the preparation types that's already in TaxonWorks. You'll notice that there's one row that has errored here. The nice thing about the importer is that you can sequentially go through and filter on those records that have erred or passed in different ways and over time slowly bring in the whole data set. 
quickest way we can see the things that have come from the import process of the Darwin Core Archive row is this new task in TaxonWorks, the object graph. Here we can see many shapes, and each of these shapes is a thing in TaxonWorks. We have pinkish purple things that are taxon names. We have a biological concept, the OTU, that's this green hexagon. We have the collection object itself here in blue. We have identifiers, orange triangles hanging off of it. We have a collecting event representation, and we have a repository. Going from rows to things is tricky, particularly when we don't have identifiers on the corresponding values in the row. So for example, here there's been a parsing error and the author name of our bumblebee has not been imported correctly. After importing to things, we have that bumblebee name, it's its own thing, so we could update the author name. Here I can search for the gear and find a record that has metadata that suggests that this is the right person and attach that person. Now if we refresh our graph, we can see the gear attached to the taxon name Bombus pennsylvanicus. I can move a little bit further and attach an identifier to the gear that would perhaps help in disambiguating this problem in future studies. Here on Wikidata, I find the record for Charles de Geer. Notice it's spelled differently. And notice that there's many known as over here. But here's what I'm interested in, this Q number right here. I can copy it, come back to our record representation of, of, of Carl or Charles, add the annotator and click the identifier. Choose global, choose Wikidata, paste the Q number and create it. Now when I come back to our graph and reload it, I can see my identifier appear on my person that's attached to my thing, the name, and I've added another identifier to my graph. So next I'll try to point out four emerging technologies and just say a little bit about them. First, the digital specimen model. This concept has been around for a long time, but recently been implemented thanks to some growing advances in the software tools that we have. Um, I'll look at the concept of event-based curation Talk about digitization by the masses, a slight twist on uh, things like notes, notes from nature, and then highlight the idea of these desktop digiters, these high throughput digitizers that could land on everybody's desk. So first, the extended digital specimen model. This is a concept that's been around for a while, but tools have sort of made it more relevant. Um, Mike came out of, in part, Mike Webster's work at Cornell as an ornithologist. And the idea is really that there is a physical specimen and then there's a digital twin. And once we digitize a specimen, we give it an identifier, we can really add a, a wealth of data beyond that and pass that along. And that's sort of what ex is, ex this idea is sort of what's been extending uh, and pushing our curatorial tools to capture more, maybe their biological associations, maybe their character states. Uh, maybe their data that we traditionally wouldn't have thought of capturing in a uh, curatorial uh, natural history curation framework. So a quick example of the extended specimen and taxon works. I've added the specimen I imported from the Delancourt archive, the collection objects to a matrix. I'm going to code it for a couple of characters. A bumblebee loves nectar, true. It hates neonics, true. And there's only on one option, so it's obviously cute and fuzzy. So next we have this idea of event-based models. And the idea is that if we're going to try to make our data fair and findable, you know, reusable, and all of these other concepts, that, we, that we're going to need to be able to pass them around in a, in a very specific or a very uh, formulated way. And that's the sort of event-based sequence and so the idea is, is that anytime we do something in the digitization process we start with an input our digital specimen we have some events in the middle and then we have an output which is our specimen plus some data so here we have we here we would have a sequencing event perhaps and the little blue dot there comes with a whole bunch of metadata and one of the arguments is that if we did this for all of the digitization processes that we do we would have a consistent way of sort of passing along data. This idea is really 
espoused out of the Dina group here that you can follow the links from. TaxonWorks doesn't use an event-based model, but we do infer events have happened when we're browsing collection objects. So we can see that it was sent for long, determined, notes were added, was biologically associated with some other taxon, etc. So another emerging technology is digitizing or digitization by the masses. And by that, we sort of look at data that's one step removed from our collection. For example, we're back to our Charles de Geer record, and we see that it has a Q number up here. But there's a ton of other metadata in Wikidata about Charles de Geer. We have many different um, synonyms or alternate names for him. And what I really want to do is get you down to one part of it here. Let's find these identifiers and to point out how many different identifiers for this person, for this thing, this human, there are and could be in a, a sort of pluralistic or multiple, multiple identifier world. We have uh, just tons and tons of identifiers, a fast ID, a NUCAD ID, a Libris URI ID. Uh, I can keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, a Freebase ID. What happened to Freebase? Uh, a Snack Arc ID, a Upsala University Alvin ID, a Zubank Author ID. So there's something like 40, 50 classes of identifiers on Wikipedia for people. And we can imagine that the quote unquote masses, the people that aren't directly doing digitization, are going to be minting identifiers like these uh, for many classes of data that we're interested in linking to for our collection objects. One other example here, back to the GR Sci call at GBIF. Notice that the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County has many identifiers seemingly of the same class. Here's two that are UUIDs, an LSID from a long time back, another UUID, another LSID. So what's going on here? Here, regardless of what technology you use, mass digitization or single person you know, digitization, uh, you're going to hit immediately the fact that you're going to duplicate records by accident or maybe on purpose. And that if you merge those records back, you're going to have to do something with those unique identifiers. And this is one of the major issues I see with the uh, identifiers in general is if we don't have a pluralistic system in place to handle them, to record them as we need them, um, then we're going to be forever sort of reconciling one identifier against another and sort of not getting to the heart of really what's important um, about the collections or the repositories that we're talking about. So to wrap up, I'd like to just point out that there are some very cool hardware products uh, and, and projects, especially the open hardware ones. And for example, the diversity scanner here, again, this is not my work. Uh, all the credit goes down to the, to the folks there at the bottom. These products are going to produce a lot of data. They're basically mass digitizers on your desktop. And we can't just do the digitization and leave the data there. There's a strong argument to, that they need to be placed into that context of things. How we go about doing that is going to be an interesting question. And with any of these mass digitization projects, of course, we're going to be able, we're going to need to deduplicate find out where we've really duplicated data and, and sort of uniquify them, so to speak. So yeah, that combination of new hardware that's generating new data, but placing it into an ongoing active curation role is really a framework that I, I think is going to become more and more common in, in, in uh, the digitization world. So in that context, I really think that TaxonWorks can be a hub or a thing integrator of sorts. The hardware that produces all of that data, the mass digitization, needs a place to put that data. And if we can put it into something like TaxonWorks, then it can be fed out to the UI. It can be sent along to a JSON API that TaxonWorks has. And that API can be used to explore OCR pipelines or you know, identity recognition pipe, pipelines. You can take all of your data offline in TaxonWorks, put it in a Docker container, and uh, explore it there so that for example, you can upload a whole uh, giant Dung core file and then use the filtering technology that it has offline. So there's nice ways to explore things there. And even if you're working on a new project or a new grant, uh, TaxonWorks may let you explore that project feasibility before you dive in and do more.
So just to wrap up then, a couple of observations. Some of these flow from what we've talked about. Other ones are just things that I've thought about throughout the process of putting this talk together. So first, the digitization ecosystem emphasizing identifiers throughout has major consequences for people during physical curation at multiple levels. Uh, second, building a curated list of these consequences would be useful to those entering the fray. So for example, if you're going to start messing with identifiers, what could go wrong and what can work and what can get better. And uh, last, building such systems without parallel practical exploration may not be the most forward if, sorry, may not be the most efficient or effective way of moving forward. So envisioning a new way of passing around fair data might sound good on paper, but until we put that into practice, we might not know uh, the real bottlenecks of those types of approaches. And finally, I'd like to invite everyone here to our second annual Taxon Works Together, December 6th to 11th. We'll have information at speciesfilegroup.org slash events. Um, there'll be lots of opportunity for you to ask questions and to learn more about what's going on in Taxon Works. Primarily from a non-technical standpoint this year, but we'll also have a, a technical day on Friday where we ask uh, questions of the developers, etc. I'll also point out that we meet every week, religiously, uh, twice a week, on Wednesdays, once with the topic being nomenclature and the other topic being digitization. But any questions are welcome there and you can again find out how to join up in those meetings through the events link above. Finally, if you have questions, please let me know or contact our community liaison, Debbie Paul. Thanks for your time and I look forward to your questions. Hi everybody. Thank you, Matt. Um, so, while we wait uh, for some questions to pop in, I have one for you and for, uh, in general, as we get ready to start the panel question, is in your idea of, um, that you present about mass, the masses and you know, per participating in this process, um, I think I have a related question to connecting these mass digitization efforts to where does the data go? So whether it's uh, the picture eye system, uh, or what Hanu showed us, or what we saw from uh, Lightning Bug, as the data comes out of those systems, could it be connected to our collection management software? Where's it going? So could it be connected, Matt? Just come right off the conveyor and... Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the general idea is that we have lots of different sources of creating data rapidly now. And um, the hope is that it goes right into that system that we have to use on a day-to-day -day basis to gather that new data as Derek sort of alluded to, right? We want to not have to digitize uh, the, the new specimens that are coming in. And so we want that data side by side in a system and a system that can do all of that is a, is a fairly complex one. Um, it's sort of a goal that TaxonWorks aspires to, to meet in the long run. But uh, yeah, I, th I think we need to figure out those routes to getting that data from numerous different sources, numerous different pieces of hardware, uh, numerous different types of digitization technology into the, the piece of software that makes the curator happy, the, the, that, you know, that lets them do additional work on top of that effort. Ah, and with that, I know that's a lovely segue into uh, the beginning of the panel discussion. And I, I see a comment from uh, Mark Harold that you can address as we begin. I would like to take a, just a moment to say the, the following panel is uh, made up of the speakers that you've just heard from, uh, as well as some invited panelists. And in the interest of time, I have two favors to ask from all the panelists. If you can, change your name to add information about who you are, where you're from, so people can know a little bit about you without you having to even say anything extra. So if you can add your affiliation or the favorite insect group you work on, but tell them a little bit of something or about which project you're affiliated with. And the other thing is if you did not speak, uh, if you do not present, please just in your first time that you speak to answer a question that you just tell us 
who you are very briefly. Um, thank you for that. So to begin, um, maybe we start with the question um, about, let's see, I'm looking at my lists. Ah, so the first question I would ask is about return on investment. And this is, is to everyone on the panel. Um, and maybe the panelists could all turn on their cameras if they have enough bandwidth. That'd be great. For return on investment, my question is about communicating value. So for any of the mass digitization efforts that you have done so far, um, are there any unique returns on investment that you've noted? So that could be for the institution, administrators, researchers, collections, donors. Um, what are some insights you can give us about return on investment? And I don't know who would like to go first, but if nobody raises their hand, I have someone I'll pick on. Okay, then. Crystal, you hinted at many potential returns on investment. Um, Sure. Um, we actually had to deal with this issue in our proposal, where the first time we submitted it, the audience could not figure out why we were digitizing all of these labels. They were like, oh, is this just a curatorial tool to keep people from having to go over to the drawer and look at the specimen? I'm like, well, yeah, sure. But the real value of having all of these labels digitized is one, you get a bank of images to compare new image labels to, right? And then you also get a huge bank of locality and biological data. Um, and I think we kind of went over some of the, um, some of the possible uses for the data. Um, I, think, I think here we're probably all too familiar with how you can use, uh -oh. hold on just a sec, or somebody else can go. I, I think, go ahead, go. Peter. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to jump in. So, um, you know, one of the, we started imaging our, our labels and specimens very early on. And um, besides just for curation, just being able to see that verbatim data, not having to go back and proof it by finding the specimen in the record, the people borrowing the specimen, so not just the digitization process, but the people who are interested in using the specimens for their research, were able to see those labels firsthand because they didn't know in the database if this was interpreted data or if that was verbatim what was on the label so being able to see the labels but also being able to see the specimens so a lot of specimens in our collection may be determined to genus but not to species and uh you know people taxonomists who want to borrow them can look through these images and say oh i'd like to borrow this one that one and the other so it's more than just the digitization process we're getting a huge return um, by our users of the collection both ecologists and taxonomists and systematists so I'll add that a case that came up with COVID here this last couple of years, one of the uh, investments is, or one of the properties you want of an investment is that it sort of protects you in the long run. And because we had digitized images early on in the workflow and just accessioned them up into the software, um, when COVID hit and nobody could go in, we had a huge wealth of images that were ready for processing by the remote team. And we saw a massive uptick in the processing. So, you know, we've always suggested that just take the image and that's, you know, having that verbatim data is the most important bit over time that the, the most useful or critical parts of that data that are in that image will emerge out as it's needed. And yes, it's nice to break down everything into every field right off the bat, but uh, at least having the image in place allows you to do that as it's needed. And hopefully th those images will let you, uh, will, will be far more effective over time as we have, you know, AI image parsing, entity recognition on top of those images. So should we invest all of that human time to do all that parsing or is having that bank of images enough of a future proofing for us? So I think future proofing is, is part of that uh, benefit gaining. And one last thought on, on top of Matt's comments there is that if anybody didn't see our presentation yesterday, we talked about using some of this named entity recognition through uh, machine learning 
to pull this text out with OCR and then parse these into the right field. So uh, that technology is there. And as Matt says, by having these things ready to go, we're ready for the next steps already. Oh, thank you for those answers. I think you can see what I was trying to get at is, are we understanding that do the stakeholders, as Crystal pointed out, that we're talking to get why we're, you know, what the value is, um, both when we're proposing it, but also are we tracking those metrics to show that this has value? And, and for example, Peter, when you, you know, you brought up ecologists, right? So their access to ready data that they can use uh, and trust and have a huge impact on both use of our specimens and recognize them of the value, right? But uh, so great to know that, that those things are being um, noted. So hopefully we can find a way to share those ideas. Um, next questions. Um, how about a uh, quick one? I'm sorry, go. Before we move on, can I ask a question that came up in the Q&A because I think it's yes. related? Okay. Please do. So Laura was wondering if any of the panelists have had outside researchers determine specimens based only on the images. Um, so is that a value proposition that you're, you're saving people uh, a visit or the transit of a specimen? And then following, what are the workflows associated with having um, a specimen described based only on the images? Crystal, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can address that. So we have almost all of our type image, types imaged, and we get requests for those all the time. And for a lot of people, that is sufficient for their needs. Obviously, for some smaller beetles, you'll need to do dissections of genitalia. Um, but I would say for a good 50% of requests, that saves us. Um, that saves us a lot of time and effort to have those images. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's well worth it. If I can comment that as well. Um, so a lot of people are using our images to request specimens or to get a better image of them. But to my knowledge, nobody has described anything from our online images, uh, partly because our images are not super high resolution. It's mostly to capture the label information. But for all the folks out there that are working on these automated systems that are presenting these super high level, high res uh, images, I think this is gonna be fantastic moving forward. It does take a lot more time to get those images and it costs a bit more, but I think the savings in the long run are gonna be worth it because it's gonna save a lot of transport of these specimens around when they can get damaged. Uh, and also things that we may not notice on these specimens that people from the outside can observe. Mm. Oh, the collective, indeed. Nicole, you have your hand up. Please jump in. Um, I'm off mute. You can hear. Ah, uh, your sound is a bit tricky, but. Um, it, uh, that question about like people doing IDs from images. We did have a project a few years ago where we had like about twelve thousand specimens, mutilla specimens, wasps, and they were all at family level. And when we imaged them, we were only imaging them for the label information to get the database records. But an expert in the US had seen some of the images and overnight we ended up with a spreadsheet back with identification um, and down to morpho species and it was sex. And so that actually quite surprised us. We weren't expecting that at all. So then we hit the, the problem, the issue that was um, asked about is that well, because all those specimens were ID'd by images by an expert that didn't sit and physically at a microscope and look at the specimen, do we update the database records and do we attach a different label to the specimens in the collection? And then do we re-curate the jewels based on um, those morpho species? And so that hit, we hit a problem in the collection about different views on that. We did actually re-curate all the specimens to morpho species, but there is a label in the drawer that says it was ID'd by an image and there's a, and the database records are updated for that, but there's also a note in the database that says it was by an image, not um, physically sitting and looking at the specimen. So we've sort of gone with that as our approach, but it has brought it up in other areas across our insect collection, which is around 12 million specimens, 
some other curators don't want to do that. Thanks, Nicole. That's fascinating. Um, and important to know whether or not you can track that in your database, right? And your 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 workflow. Yeah. Luke, you wanted to jump in. Thank you for joining uh, yeah, us. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think um, at Nakarawas, you don't really have researchers uh, IDing um, images, but I think uh, we are very near to a, a situation where we can use image recognition in combination with nice images of collection specimens, especially for the groups and the genera and species which are easily recognizable. Um, I think that the, the, the tools we're now using in nature to recognize um, live insects in, in, in nature are easily um, transferable to the collection situation. And if you have, especially if you have high resolution uh, images of certain groups, I'm sure that a lot of them can be identified uh, using these APIs uh, on, on, on images taken from collection specimens. Of course, it requires in the beginning that specialists have to ID quite a bunch of images of the respective groups to make sure that the, the, the tool is properly um, um, properly filled with uh, ideas. But uh, once once the tool is there, I'm sure you could you could um, based on just an image you could use an, an, an uh, image recognition tool to to do the to, to do the identification. Wow, exciting developments for sure. So I have more questions, but please put questions in the in the Q and A for the panelists if you if you have some. And I wanted to go back and thank also for those of you that Nicole, you might notice is joining us from down under in CSIRO, or at least it's down under from where I sit on the planet. Uh, so thanks for joining us at a very early hour for you. Ah, um, there's also things going on in the chat as well. So to the next question, until one of you all jumps in, um, I would ask about uh, briefly about costs. So. What can you say uh, relative to cost of doing this type of digitization, um, any of the kinds that were described here uh, now and in the future? Yeah, Hanu. You're muted, Hanu. Nope, oh, still not, it's still muted. Not sure why. No. Now it's good. Okay, we have been practicing this in Finland longer than than most of you, and we I, I just presented uh, our group just presented uh, some results. Uh, one operator six seventy six thousand fully imaged, fully transcribed specimens per year. If you think about the cost of one operator, uh, the salary cost, uh, etc., is about uh, 60,000 euro. The hard, cost of hardware is if divided for uh, five years, is about uh, 20,000 per year. So we coming, we, we have evidence of about one euro or a little bit more uh, sustained over five years, and that's that, that's for you all others to beat. Anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on. Um, yeah, there, there's a push, especially through the ADBC program, to get the cost per specimen down to some minimal level, say one dollar per specimen, and you know it's it's really not doable. It's to we are using student labor, which we can get fairly cheaply, um, but that doesn't give us enough leftover money for for having a technician to oversee it. So a lot of us are putting in our our time to oversee the projects. And so, um, you know, to see an investment in something larger like this that is sustained for a longer time, it's very encouraging. I really like this European model where they have these centralized digitization centers where it's a 
you know, a lot of technology employed, but, um, you know, this push to keep the cost per specimen down is really making it difficult to do. Luke, you wanted to add something? Um, yeah, I, I find it always very difficult to, um, this question about costs, of course, always comes up because it's, everybody looks at money, of course. But in the end, um, it's very difficult to really compare one technical solution with the other, one collection with the other. Um, so um, I, 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 I very much understand this, this discussion, but it's if somebody says uh, in my situation it costs uh, one dollar and another one says it costs me 50 cents, I really want to know exactly what it, what you get for that money exactly and whether you get uh, images or not whether you how much of your data uh, on your label is being transformed is it uh, georeferenced is it etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's i understand the question but the answer i think is is do, is it is it a bearing specimen is it a, is it a fruit fly is it a, i don't know it makes a lot of difference which collections you are talking about in which country you are do, you, you're doing it what, what are the sell, local salaries Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it's the question to pose the question is easy, but to get an answer, I think the answer is not there. And I think we have to be very careful to come up with one number. It's I don't think it's it's quite quite like that. Yeah. So I, and I think that's part of the important thing to gather and share, especially with the funders. Right. The answer mm -hmm. is it depends. Yes, it depends. <laughs> yeah, yes. for sure. Um, but I think knowing what those variables are and being being very clear helps us both on the proposal side and on the return on investment side, you know, what are we going to be able to do with what we're, what we're creating? Um, so I think we have time for a few more questions and, um, oh, ooh, I see the Q and A button turned on. Let's see. Ah, excellent. Let's try Aaron's question next then. Uh, once a collection is digitized, will the technology have improved so much that it should be digitized again? I'm wondering if this is something that will need to be done every few decades. Any takers for that question? I can I can make a comment uh, regarding the use of um, registration codes to start with because um, I started my career in digitization uh, in the in the 90s and the first thing I used was uh, barcode 37 uh, registration codes. And within 10 years, there were QR codes. Um, so yes, and of course, the first uh, efforts I did photographing and bearing sheets were quite nice for the time in the 90s, but uh, 10 years later, uh, the cameras were better, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, there is a, there is a problem with, uh, not a problem, but um, it's, it will be, I think, an ever ongoing question about if you, if you are ahead of the rest of the world today, maybe in 10 years, you're behind all the rest of the world. So. I have not the answer, but it's it's a fact of life, I'm sure, yes. Crystal, you are next, I believe. Gotta unmute her. Yeah, we already have requests for type images to be done over again because the, the images are so poor quality. Um, but I think with the QR codes and the barcodes, though, those don't, those aren't necessarily obsolete. Correct? Well, um, I'm not sure. Um, QR codes are maybe not obsolete, but maybe, I'm, I'm just, maybe, well, uh, yeah. RFIDs are something uh, which could be introduced in the near future inside i would this. love to switch to those <laughs> yes but that means that you have to replace your your or anyway but so that yes technology doesn't stop with uh, qr codes in front but it, yeah and i think that's also a really good case for why we need to keep these collections around after we digitize right because that's a common question that we get you know oh you digitized it you can throw it away now um because technology is always getting better and better I don't think we digitize to throw away the insects. I think we digitize to make them accessible, to make the world known that we have the collection, that we have these investments. So in a way, uh, if, if, uh, if that would be the result of, of digitization, I would be, I would kill myself almost immediately because oh, that's, that's the, last, the last thing I would, I would really- <laughs> Me <for>. too. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, Hanu wants to jump in on the same question. Yes, uh, um, in, in the insect the pin, we only need a unique identifier. The rest of the data can be held in database. This is the work, way it worked 100 years ago when there were no laser printers where you could print uh, details that we are now struggling to digitize. Uh, I, I think uh, we should consider going back to those practices of field, field books where there is only catalog number and the catalog number is in the pin, which is easy to digitize. This doesn't help digitizing. Well, this idea doesn't help digitizing uh, what has accumulated during the past 100 years, but it will certainly help digitizing the older specimens and the future specimens. Mm. Oh, and how would you add to that, Pete? Well, I have to say that uh, Hanu makes a really good point that um, you know, once we have a record, we can keep adding to it. So it's not the end product. We can continue uh, enhancing that. But we have a case in point where we digitized a whole bunch of our specimens um, without pictures. And I was very smug when we started taking pictures. Look how great we are. We've got these pictures people can go back to. But now with this Big B project, not all of them have a good view of the intertegular distance, something we want to get out of these images. And so do we go back and re-image those things and, and add them to the database for this particular project? So there will always be more information we want to get from a specimen, and we can continue to add more to it. Um, but you know, do we have to go back and digitize them again? No, I don't think so, but we can continue adding to them. I like the or raise my hand. Uh, I like the question that Derek keeps bringing up about uh, digitizing new specimens. So maybe one way to think about cost per old specimen is to figure out the minimum cost per new specimen and use that as a lower bound for our expectations, right? I, I, I agree that I think that there are real physical limits to how cheap a specimen can get. And regardless if it's a butterfly that takes, you know, 20 minutes to digitize and a beetle that can be done with a digital arm, when we scale over 50 million specimens, we're going to get a very concrete limit on average. There will be a nice distribution of how much time it takes. And I think we could estimate that pretty, you know, pretty nicely already, We uh, given, given our collective experience. So let's get maybe focused on making sure that everything coming in is digital and what are the tools that we need to do to ensure that no, nothing, you know, or our, our baseline is met with new digitization. Let's figure out how much that costs. And then maybe we have another baseline estimate to work with. Cool. So I think I hear a theme there too, that is this, this bigger question we could spend more time on uh, another time about how does the taxonomist and their workflows fit into the digitization process, but be it mass or however, so that you have this connection that Eric, Nicole is pointing out also in the chat about, you know, we're adding more knowledge, right? And we are talking about this value, this value proposition of why are we doing this? And it's as Luke said, you know, and, and Nicole and others about access to the knowledge, right? And the specimen is, is key to that. So making sure that we convey that as you know why why do this um cool so i would like to take us to um one more question maybe two they are related uh to wrap up this and please add extra questions that the panelists can take um offline later what is one thing each of us could do now to speed up digitization so from the panelists um suggest depending on what our roles are obviously our spheres are different what are things we could do i'll i'll jump in uh demand that you never have to rename a file name an image file name uh, too many workflows are still doing this and um, software can address this issue so you can speed up your workflows by not renaming images all right, cool. I'll point out briefly that, that that's exactly the same point that um, Hanu made 
um, a moment ago about uh, not renaming in the broader sense, adding information to the pin. That is really, it's just a matter of having a unique enough identifier in the first place and being done with it. <laughs> I'll just point out that that unique identifier in an image is calculated from the properties of the image itself. It's called a hash. And so we don't need to redo that. And that's how we should be sharing images as well. So the properties about what's in the image and what you're taking a picture of, et cetera, go in the data. They don't go in the file name, for example. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the nature of the identifier comes from the bits of the image, the actual ones and zeros, not the content of the image. I, I have to disagree with that though, to some degree, because it's an important part of our workflow that we're pulling information from that file name as we go. It's got our taxon name, it's got the catalog number and that information otherwise might not be there. And so, you know, it's, I can see the value of not renaming that, but part of our renaming is automatically when we take the picture, part of our software renames it as it goes. So it's not adding a lot of time to ours. I think so, there's other, oh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. I'll just, I'll just, I don't want to get into debate about it, but the idea is that you're typing a name in an identifier. Um, so why not do that in a set of metadata on a form and then drop those images on so that it's captured natively in the database rather than on the file and then processed? Yeah, there's, cool. Like I said, any other ideas? We have, we have lots of, we don't have a lot of time, but. Other ideas, one thing that each of us could do now to speed up digitization, BB collection managers, data managers, taxonomists, ecologists, naming and parking can be automated, doing it manually. I'm just reading the comments. Oh, Nicole, please. I mean, in an odd, if we could change our workflows, it would be not adding to the legacy that we already got in our collection. So being a bit more born digital, where we're capturing the data in the field, not bringing the specimens in, putting them into the compactus, into the drawers and that sort of thing, and then pulling them out 20 years later and then digitizing them. So we have to sort of flip that around. So we're digitizing it as it comes into the collections. But that's, that's such a hard, a hard thing to do when you're looking at millions and millions of specimens. I think Derek is doing cartwheels right now to hear you say that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> agreed. I think we all have to do that. We all have to be capturing things born digital, but you know, we do have these legacy of, of many millions, if not billions of specimens. So um, yeah, I don't know how you can speed it up, but we're, we're all trying, right? That's why we're all here. I'd love to hear right. more advice. Yeah. Well, and again, figure out. So that takes me to, the next question then that's related. Um, what is one thing each of us could do now uh, to foster sharing expertise and lessons learned? So sharing these ideas, sharing these efficiencies, um, what's one thing we could do now to foster that process? So it's not just once a year, for example, in a symposium like this one. I, I think if I may, may um, um, give a comment, um, I, I, I think one of the one of the um, um, things we we are very we are doing very poorly um, is is maybe not everybody agrees, but somehow make having a, a, a point uh, or a place uh, a website where you can find this, all these documentations we are talking about in, in a structured way so that if you are really starting or interested in, in a topic related to digitization in, in whatever way, that there is one website which is very nicely kept up to date, everybody can access it, everybody knows about it. And that's where you find your information. That's something which is it's not there and it will probably it will not be there in the next 10 years, but that would be nice if you would have it. To, to answer a lot of questions and to also to streamline our efforts. I mean, if talking to, to, to all of you now, I realize that even though I try to keep up with um, new developments, it's very difficult to keep up with new developments unless you have a central point where you can easily find everything. And that's why we don't have it. 
I see comments about bug flow going by. So that's at least one idea for uh, a central place to share potential workflows and riffs on those workflows. If you have your, you take the, the template of tasks and you break those tasks down into your own workflow at your community and then you share that information uh, via this resource. And you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Crystal, I think that your mic is on. Are you still here? Um, I think she had to go at the top of the hour. The, the idea would be that uh, everybody can share there and not just entomological workflows. I think the idea in the future is to open that up. Other ideas? We have time for maybe one or two more. Yeah, if I, if I can jump in. So uh, especially here at the university, and this came up a little earlier, we have, uh, you know, our our uh, workforce is our students mostly. And um, looking at the some of the European presentations today where they have these centralized digitization centers where it's it's a very automated sort of thing. It's a high cost up front, but it seems to be worth it in the long run to be able to put these into you know some automation here. Rather than have our students act like robots, let's have robots act like robots and do the things that are very robotic. Of course, there is the sensitivity of having, you know, very delicate specimens. We want to be very careful about them, but, you know, robots can be careful too, sometimes more careful than, you know, a student who's worrying about the next exam. So I think we should reconsider um, from the U.S. point of view, some of the, and we've tried some automation. We've tried automatic photographing systems that come from different angles, and none of those are in production right now that I, I'm aware of, but um, I know, you know, Mark and Crystal presented the um, lightning bug, but I, I think our model of having individuals do robotic tasks is you know, maybe not the best way to go. Would add about the robotic tasks just briefly that as a community from a software development and, and tool perspective, digital tool perspective, if we concentrated on really nailing down isolated things like uh you know ocr or named entity recognition and we made those modules shareable to all you know corporate or private we would uh greatly speed up our ability to work those tools into workflows so there's there's a there's a small set of tools that we know we need from a software development perspective if the world could get together and build those and make them available in a very lightweight uh, accessible sort of software um, approach, we would all benefit greatly. Um, on that following on that for, uh, for one second, uh, Matt, how do you guys as a community feel about um, packaging those kinds of things as services so that um, you never actually even have to think about installing so much as just using some sort of a fairly lightweight, restful thing and the all of the meat sort of lives out there somewhere in the cloud or effectively in the cloud at some institution. We hear that argument a lot, but I think it, what it comes down to is a why not both. Well, architected software can be run offline and meet the needs of most people. Um, for example, global names parsing of billions of documents can be done on your laptop as well as a service. So to me, I don't think there's a dichotomy there. I think it's a why not both. Um, so we're over time and me, I love this and I love having y'all in the same room and I never wanted to end, but I have to respect your time. I know there's a question from Chris Grinter in the Q&A. Perhaps some of you could tackle that of uh, typing the answer. Um, and I would like to say thank you for your perspectives on that last topic and ask you to think about the skills uh, being acquired to Hanu and I have talked extensively about this in the past so when people are participating in some of these robotic they are the assisting right they're putting the specimens or moving them what are they learning and what are they getting out of it skills wise because there's still those new specimens coming into the collection when the mass digitization is over so it has to be a joint effort it has to be a combined effort um, yeah thank you everybody um any final burning thoughts that you're dying to share before we say goodbye thank you thumbs up from everybody you know for participating for your great mm -hmm. questions and for everybody who is a panelist and a speaker um, we have some work to do, but we have a lot of exciting developments too. So thanks for that. From Hanu, from Erica, uh, and myself, thank you. Thank you all.
Obrigado. Muito Thanks. Bom. Isso. Will somebody tackle Chris's question in the in the Q and A?